uh, let's see, the first thing I, I wanted to uh, uh, ask, uh, first thing I, I wanted to tell you was, uh, you know, I have been making these little fact sheets for, for people for all of these plays, uh, mm -hmm. but, uh, um, you know, you really have a built-in fact sheet in a way about each of these plays that, that's on the Stratford Festival website, and I, and I really didn't recognize it uh, until mm -hmm. yesterday. Uh, for example, I'm looking at the entry for Macbeth, which we're talking about today. And, uh, you know, there's a description about the play, surrender to a haunting story of ambition and its dark consequences as a military hero and his wife conspire to seize the throne of Scotland. A good, a good uh, mm -hmm. summary in one sentence of a complex play. And then underneath that sentence, it says, house program. Well, that means that uh, you have access mm -hmm to the same program that uh, theater goers had when they went to the festival theater four years ago mm -hmm. to, see this, uh, to see this production. Uh, and what you simply do is to click on the red title. I mean, you, right next to house program, there's a, the word Macbeth in red. You click on Macbeth and it will bring up the full program that you would have had in the festival theater wow. four years ago. And it's shock full of great information you know the full credits of the cast and the uh and the creative staff of the theater uh essays by uh, by the director and by the literary manager of the stratford festival and all kinds of all kinds of good stuff uh so i would encourage you when you go to see these films that you also take an opportunity to click on the red title of each play where it says house program, and you'll be able to see what the Stratford Festival wanted you to know about uh, each of these uh, plays uh, and each of their um, each of their you know specific production I interpretations. So, Michael, uh, can I ask you a question? Yes. Yeah. Well, we're in there now, and uh, all of these appear to be just when you touch them, they go to a video. Okay. Find well, the wrong spot. Yes. Well, uh, you you don't uh, you don't uh, uh, you don't go, go to one of those. Uh, I mean, they, they have like four. You've got watch now, and then underneath you have four videos about Macbeth. But above above that, there's this uh, one sentence uh, description of the play, and under that sentence it, it says house program, and uh, and then you see in red Macbeth, and click on that red title. This is this is on the Stratford web website. This is not. Uh, when you go to YouTube, this is just on the Stratford website. Yeah, You'll yeah that's really access are, but to this program. Yeah. So, do you see that? No, because uh, their very their home page is just showing uh, boxes that hit here. I'll show you. All their home page is showing for each one is this, and it it just when you right. touch any of it, it uh, it all of them say "Watch now, watch now" or "On demand." So we end up with, it goes to the video. Okay, yeah. This is on their website. I must be in the wrong place. You might be in the wrong part of their website. Uh, okay, yeah, we'll, yeah. Look, so, we'll look through okay. it. Okay. Yeah, we'll, but, we'll but look for it, look for it. Yeah. Basic, yeah. Basically, uh, <laughs> you know, when you, uh, when you uh, this, is, this is what I do. When I, when I go to their website, I am, I'm looking for the square that says Stratford Festival, the best of Shakespeare from the comfort of home, streaming online for free, including bonus content not otherwise available. Click on that box, not on, a, not on any of the other boxes. Click on that box, it'll bring up everything they have to offer at this time. And you'll see each of the plays in its own specific row. Found it. And there's a row for The Tempest, there's a row for Time and of Athens, there's a row for Love's Labor's Lost, and there's a row for Macbeth. And you will see Again, uh, next to where it says streaming, May 7th to May 28th, you'll see this one sentence description, and then you'll see house program, Macbeth. Click on that red icon for Macbeth, it will bring up the full program uh, that they uh, used for their theater goers in 2016. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes, we, we got there finally, yeah. Great, great. So, so take advantage of it. I just discovered yeah. it this week for Macbeth. I did not see it. Uh, for any of these other other pieces, but uh, uh, it's it's great because it gives you the uh, their official uh, information about about the play, 
and uh, hopefully that'll be a great uh, enrichment for your, your viewing of the piece. Now, I wanted to ask you if any of you saw this promotion that they were offering for a viewing party that took last place night. last night. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, they were going to uh, stream uh, a, a, a short film uh, about the uh, first season of the Stratford Festival, uh, a film called The Stratford Adventure. It was, this was a film that was made, I guess, in 1953 or 1954, uh, all about how their first season came to be. Uh, and, uh, and along with that, they had an interview uh, with uh, an actress who was there for that very first season in, the, in 1953, named Dawn, I think her, name, her last name was pronounced Green, Green, Green Half, uh, Dawn, Dawn Green Half. Uh, and it was a really lovely evening. Did any of you get a chance to, to see yes. that uh, viewing party? We tried, but ours, wasn't yours interrupted? We saw the interview. Yes, yes, it was. It was interrupted. Uh, but if you go to if you go to to find the Stratford Adventure on YouTube, you will find that archived on YouTube. So you can oh. see that film. It's about about a thirty nine minute film. Uh, you can see that at your convenience now. Uh, oh, okay. And uh, you know, and it's a film that definitely shows its period. It's it's not it's not a state of the art movie, but it's a great uh, it's a great uh, uh, you know, piece of history because you get to see people like Tyrone Guthrie, the first artistic director of the festival, and you get to see Alec Guinness, who was their star, mm -hmm. and Irene Worth, who was their star that first season, and uh, and the person whose idea it was in the first place, Tom Patterson. Uh, so it really is a, a, a neat little bit of history. It's sort of like a little time capsule. And, uh, and uh, you know, and that recent interview that was given by this actress who was with the festival right at its beginning, Dawn Greenhalf, well, it was just darling, just lovely. She's a, she's a very uh, engaged and uh, amusing, uh, uh, you know, woman all these years later. And it was just a great treat to hear her recollections of how she got involved uh, with the, uh, with the festival. But, but yes, it was very disconcerting to start this viewing this film and find maybe nine or ten minutes in that uh, there was something going wrong and then uh, they had to interrupt the proceedings and I don't know if you noticed there were these little comments by various viewers who mm -hmm. were who were involved with this viewing party and and one of the one of the viewers uh, one of the viewers asked the question in this little live chat uh, did anyone mention Macbeth well, they probably didn't because of the Scottish play thing. <laughs> right, right. Yes. Yeah. So, so, you know, this, this play that we're going to be talking about today, it is surrounded by this huge uh, tradition of superstition about this play. The notion that Macbeth is an unlucky play. Uh, and oh. I think this is, you know, very well known among theater folk. Uh, but, you know, I think that this is not just a, uh, you know, just a trade talk for, uh, you know, for theater people. I think people uh, outside of the theater world have become aware about this phenomenon, this notion that there is something unlucky, uh, maybe just uh, that there's maybe some kind of supernatural power surrounding this play. I mean, the play itself is about supernatural forces, but I think that even outside of the action of Macbeth, there are people who feel that, that this piece has the, this kind of cursed quality about it. And so I just want to open the forum to, to you, uh, if you can uh, elaborate on this, you know, if just by your uh, knowledge of this tradition, you know, what can you tell us about this uh, phenomenon, which I don't really think attack, attaches to any other Shakespeare play, at least not to this extent. So uh, would anyone like to jump in uh, and, uh, and exp expound on this phenomenon? 
Well, I don't know anything specific about it, but they refer to it as a Scottish play. They won't even say the name. Could you? Yes. I couldn't. Hear. So, so, so this thing about the about about the name. Uh, so there's this basic thing that it you know for us we don't have to worry. We can talk about Macbeth here till we're blue in the face. I guarantee you nothing's going to happen. We are <laughs> we are clean. We're scot free. But oh, if you God. are if you are not involved with a production of the play, if you're not involved with rehearsing the play or performing the play, if you happen to be in the theater, especially if you're backstage in the backstage area of the theater and you mention the play Macbeth Oh boy, the fur will fly. People will look at you cross-eyed and they might give you a good uh, finger point, finger wagging or giving you a real uh, tongue lashing. And uh, you'll, you'll have a lot to uh, repent if, by saying that, that dreaded name. Uh, and so people come up with all these euphemisms. They call it the Scottish play or the Bard's play or maybe they might call it uh, uh, McBee, maybe, or Mackie, uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, something, you know, but not the name. It's almost like you should not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. <laughs> I mean, this is almost like a theatrical commandment. Thou shalt not take the name of Macbeth in vain, especially, especially in a theater. So uh, any, any other remembrances about this, uh, this uh, theater lore? Yeah, uh, isn't there an expression uh, among actors where they find out that they're going to be paid? Is this something like the ghost walks or something like that? <laughs> it's, uh, that's, 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 that's possible. That's possible. I don't know, know if that's connected with the ghost of Macbeth or not. Uh, mm -hmm. There are, of course, lots of mm -hmm. uh, legendary theatrical ghosts supposedly lurking in various uh, renowned theaters. So, mm -hmm. so it might refer to, to the, one of those other theatrical ghosts. Possible, possible. Uh, any other, uh, any other um, knowledgeable uh, people about this phenomenon? I, I just have a, a funny thing that, um, have y'all seen Black Adder on PBS? The show okay, I, I know of the show, but I haven't seen it. Oh, well, in the, um, in the period of the Shakespearean period, um, they, he, he does, Blackadder does, there's like five, it's like three or about four seasons. And each season has like maybe five uh, what, series. There's five series, yeah. And so um, in, in the period of Shakespeare, they, he does this thing about where they talk about Macbeth and the actors, whenever, um, <laughs> whenever, uh, what's his name? Um, a role, this is Nick. Rowan, uh, Rowan Atkinson? At, Atkinson. Whenever he oh. says, whenever he says Macbeth, the actors who are in the little uh, series, they start, they do a hand clap and something like this. They do all kind of hand motions like that uh, gets rid of the hex, you know? <laughs> yes. It's really cute. Yes. So, you know, this is actually mentioned in the Wikipedia article I found called The Scottish Play. Uh, and, mm -hmm. and what it says about this in an episode called Sense and Senility, a parody ritual performed by two actors involves slapping each other's hands, yep. patty cake fashion, mm -hmm. with a quick spoken ritual. Hot potato, orchestra stalls, puck will make amends. Uh, yeah. So <laughs> I've never seen the show, but it's, oh, it sounds like it's very uh, amusing. It's, a, it's hilarious. But, <laughs> but it, it's, it's only a slight, it's only a slight exaggeration of real uh, theater people with their superstitions. Uh, now, um, do any of you know about, you know, if someone should by chance say the word Macbeth and say in the back of Shays Buffalo or in the back of the Cavanoke Theater mm -hmm. or the Irish Classical Theater, uh, what do you do? How do you, how do you break the curse? Does anyone know about the, the rituals that would be involved in that? No, I don't know. Well, if you don't, I'll tell you. So, <laughs> so here's, here's the cure. And this, this is, again, according to this uh, Wikipedia article. So it says it includes turning 
three times. So turn around three times, spit over one's left shoulder, <laughs> swear, and recite a line from another of Shakespeare's plays. Uh, <laughs> and uh, handy lines for this purpose include Angels and Ministers of Grace Defend Us from Hamlet, If We Shadows Have Offended from A Midsummer Night's Dream, and Fair Thoughts and Happy Hours Attend on You from The Merchant of Venice, mm. which for some reason is considered one of Shakespeare's lucky plays. <laughs> Don't know why. Uh -huh. So, so remember that. If you're ever in this situation, if you're in an amateur theatrical, and someone mentions Macbeth, turn around three times, spit. Maybe not in this pandemic in there, but you can mind <laughs> spitting, you know. And uh, swear, everyone can do that, and recite one of those lovely lines from Shakespeare. You think, you think that's potent enough to break the curse? <laughs> Oh, that's what that's what theater people have thought yeah. uh, for, for many, many years. It all seems very, very silly. But, you know, I've been in theater and, you know, I find myself at times using the term the Scottish play, even though wow. I'm certainly not terribly uh, superstitious as a, as, a, as a rule. But uh, it just it's part of the it's part of the folklore. And uh, sometimes it's just fun to play with those little, um, those little, uh, uh, you know, customs, those little traditions. Uh, so the, the question is, is Macbeth really an unlucky play? Is there, is there evidence for that? Uh, so uh, here's a, uh, here's someone who, uh, who uh, chimes in. This is written by a, uh, oh, I don't, have the name of the author, but uh, this is by, uh, oh yeah, this is uh, someone who's, who works at that recreation of the Globe Theater in England, a, a manager named David Bellwood. He says, I was once a dancer on tour in Riverdance and a school friend of mine had died. To cheer me up, the fiddle player bought me a complete, uh, a, a beautiful complete works of Shakespeare. We were flicking through it and another friend said, I studied Macbeth at school. Well, I told her it was bad luck to say Macbeth and joked, I should make you go outside, turn around three times and spit on the floor. In that evening's performance, two of the violinist's strings snapped spontaneously. <laughs> One woman fell off the stage. Oh another dancer, <laughs> another danced straight into a wall and knocked herself <laughs> unconscious, oh. unconscious. And I told my friend, never say it again. <laughs> um, now, so that's one, that's one person's uh, testimony. Now, according, th th there's, a, there's another statement by uh, an actor named uh, Donald Sinden, a very skilled uh, classical actor, who says this is all hogwash, nonsense. Uh, so he says about this, uh, he says, contrary to popular myth, Shakespeare's tragedy Macbeth is not the unluckiest play as superstition likes to portray it. Exactly the opposite. The origin of the unfortunate moniker dates back to repertory theater days when each town and village had at least one theater to entertain the public. If a play was not doing well, it would invariably get pulled and replaced with a surefire audience pleaser. Macbeth guaranteed full houses. So when the weekly theater newspaper, The Stage, was published, listing what was in each theater uh, in the country, it was instantly noticed what shows had not worked the previous week as they had been replaced by a definite crowd pleaser, namely Macbeth. More actors have died during performances of Hamlet than in the Scottish play, as the profession still calls it. It is forbidden to quote from it backstage as this could cause the current play to collapse and have to be replaced, causing possible unemployment. So, so that's a, the theater, a real theater insider giving his, uh, 
giving his opinion uh, about this. But uh, you know, there are there are others who 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 do say that there are uh, historical instances. Uh, uh, for example, uh, there is a tale about a production that Laurence Olivier did with the Old Vic Theater in 1937. Uh, it says a falling a falling stage weight just missed landing on Olivier during uh, the run of the show. And then the director and the actress playing Lady Macbeth were involved in a car crash. The play's opening was postponed. And on its first night, uh, the actress's, uh, uh, whose last name was Bayless, the actress's portrait fell off the theater wall. And they used real weapons and one flew into the audience, giving oh, someone God. a heart attack. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, it, this article also mentions a production in 1942 starring John Gielgud. It says during the run of that play, the costume designer committed suicide. Uh, so not funny. Um, in the 19th century, there was a, uh, uh, an instance where there were two productions of Macbeth going on in New York City. Uh, this is in 1849. Uh, there was one production featuring a renowned English actor named William McCready. And then there was uh, an American actor doing a production named Edw Edwin Forrest. Uh, both well-loved actors, but they each had their partisans. Well, in any case, the, uh, uh, the English actor was performing at a theater called the Astor Opera House, and there was a demonstration, there was a riot that was held outside this Astor Opera House. And there were, there were scores of people who were injured in this riot and supposedly at least 20 people died during oh. this riot. I don't know if we can ascribe it to the play, but uh, it was one of the great uh, you know, disasters in, uh, in American theater history. There's, a, uh, there's another example that uh, uh, someone in my other Shakespeare class can attest to being uh, at least an audio witness to. In, uh, in 1988, there was a, a, a singer uh, and a coach uh, named Bancho Banchevsky, who committed suicide during a nationally uh, broadcast uh, matinee of Giuseppe Verdi's opera version of Macbeth. He propelled himself backwards from the, a balcony railing at the Metropolitan Opera House at Lincoln Center. And oh. uh, my, my, uh, my friend who was in this other class remembers listening to that broadcast over the radio and realizing that, my gosh, the intermission has lasted or inordinately long today. And, and I wonder why. And that's the reason why they canceled the rest of the performance because oh. of this horrific uh, incident. So uh, according to, if you're really superstitious, you might say that the curse of Macbeth even extends to uh, adaptations of Shakespeare's play. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, Don. Uh, Michael, Linda and I have been to London and we visited the Globe Theater. Now, if you know, the Globe Theater has a thatched roof. And at the beginning of the performance, a cannon is fired from the roof to announce the beginning of the play. Well, I don't know if they were playing Hamlet or not, but <laughs> right after the, the cannon went off, the thatch roof started to burn, burned the whole place down. And so they had to rebuild it. Oh my gosh. That's wow. Bad look. It probably doesn't have anything to do with Macbeth, but it's pretty darn bad look. <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah, I have a feeling it pro probably was a, a different play, but uh, yeah, I, I think they should definitely cut the cannon. I, I, I don't think that's a, uh, that's, I don't think that's a good, uh, good uh, uh, policy I, to, to have when it comes to the, the to the theater. Uh, and you know, I mentioned the old Vic. Uh, supposedly, there was a production in 1980 of Macbeth uh, that starred Peter O'Toole, and supposedly that production was so bad that it was renamed by theater people as Macdeath. Uh, <laughs> and it, was, it got such horrible reviews that it actually moved 
the, 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 the company to close permanently. That's, that's a pretty big, uh, that's a pretty big theater curse, you know, to actually close down uh, a theater company. So, uh, so there's a whole lot of this kind of stuff going, going on surrounding this play. Uh, and uh, I, I don't know exactly what's going on, why this has happened to this play. Uh, you know, there, there are some people who think that Shakespeare might have actually used actual actual uh, witches incantations for the three mm. witches that opened the play, uh, that he actually made use of actual spells. And the, the, the tale, the story goes that uh, supposedly when, when actual witches became aware that Shakespeare had done this, they actually put a curse on the play because they were so annoyed that their trade secrets, trade secrets were made public uh, like that. So could this be the reason? It's an interesting story. We'll mm. never know, but, uh, but it certainly makes for an interesting story. Now, there certainly are other plays uh, about, by Shakespeare that, uh, that deal in magical arts I mean, the play we'll talk about next week, uh, The Tempest, certainly has a lot of magic in that play. But uh, I, let's, let's call that more white magic. I would say in Macbeth, it's really black magic we're talking about, and it's pretty dangerous stuff. And I would say this is, this is his real play about the supernatural, uh, much more than, than most of his other, other productions. And it does kind of make you wonder what is this interest in magic and the supernatural and witchcraft? What, what possessed Shakespeare, I'm using uh, that, that term advisedly, what possessed Shakespeare to go down this route for this particular story? Any, any thoughts on that? Um, I think I read somewhere where James I was in the audience for this performance, and he was James VI of Scotland, and same man, James I of England. And he was into all this magical, this, this magic and um, supernatural stuff. And it, they, the, what I was reading, I think I was reading in Asimov, that he said uh, he, Shakespeare did some of this to please him because he knew he was going to be in the first audience of this play. Okay. Well, I think, I think you've, you've hit the nail right on the head. Uh, and indeed, you know, this was really something that I was not aware of before beginning this class, that... Uh, that King James really had a, a, a tremendous interest in this subject. Uh, and, you know, there were, there were other people who scoffed about this. They thought this was mere, you know, uh, you know just, just not, nothing to be taken seriously. But, but James was very, very, very different. So uh, let, me, let me read from an article that I found on a website called Wonders and Marvels. And, and, it, and the, the title of the, uh, of the article is King James I, Demonologist. Um, so, and this is by a, a writer named Mary Sherratt. And, it's, and it's, the subtitle is A Deeply Superstitious Man. So, even by the standards of his age, King James VI of Scotland, later James I of England, stood out as a deeply superstitious man, obsessed with the occult. Before his reign, witchcraft persecutions had been rare in Britain, but that all changed in 1590, when James personally oversaw the trials by torture for, for around 70 individuals implicated in the North Berwick witch trials, the biggest Scotland had known. Their alleged crime, raising a storm which nearly sank James's ship when he sailed home from Norway which, mm -hmm. with his new bride, Anne of Denmark. The trial resulted in possibly dozens of people being burned at the stake, although the precise number is unknown. In 1597, James published Demonology. Uh, and, uh, and it's spelled in the, in the, in the Old English, D-A-E, 
M-O-N-O-L-O-G-I-E, Daemonology. Uh, and this was his rebuttal uh, of another book, uh, Reginald Scott's The Discovery of Witchcraft, which was a more skeptical account of this subject. Uh, it, it questioned the very existence of witches. Demonology was an alarmist book presenting the idea of a vast conspiracy of satanic witches threatening to undermine, undermine the nation. In 1604, only one year after James ascended to the English throne, he passed his new Witchcraft Act, which made raising spirits a crime punishable by execution. James's, James's ideas on witchcraft were later popularized by Shakespeare's play Macbeth, performed for James's court in 1606. For the first time in history, English drama depicted witches gathering in secret for their own malign scheming. According to a book by James Sharp called Instruments of Darkness, this terror of supposed witches, witch covens was the driving factor mobilizing 17th century witch hunts. Uh, in 1612, the king's paranoid fantasy of satanic conspiracy planted in the minds of local magistrates eager to win him, win his favor, culminated in one of the key manifestations of the Jacobean witch craze, the trials of the Lancashire witches, accused of plotting to blow up Lancaster Castle with gunpowder. Eight women and two men were executed. James's legacy extends even into our age. The King James Bible, completed in 1611, saw the scriptures rewritten to further the king's agenda. Exodus chapter 22, verse 18, was originally translated as, thou must not suffer a poisoner to live. This became, thou must not suffer a witch to live. Um, and here, here endeth the lesson. <laughs> well, uh, how many of you were aware of this uh, legacy of James the first? When I read it's pretty, pretty astonishing. And, uh, and you know, it even affects American history because without the, uh, the witch hunt hysteria that started out in England, would we have had the witch hunt hysteria in the Massachusetts Bay Colony in the later part of the 17th century, our, our famed Salem witch trials? They, this may never have become a thing if it wasn't for James the first. Uh, and then again, uh, we would not have our great American play by Arthur Miller, The Crucible, all about the Salem witch trials. He, he would have lost a metaphor for the McCarthy hearings in the 1950s if it wasn't for King James I. So uh, his, his influence on, on Anglo-American culture is really pretty large. And it all begins because, uh, you know, he, his ship almost got sunk in a storm at sea, and he thought there's no, there's no real cause. It has to be witches, you know. Uh, so uh, uh, that's uh, that. That really had grave repercussions. Uh, did I see a hand for you, Betty? No. Okay. All right. Carry on. Uh, all righty. So uh, so this is really baked in to this play. This notion that Shakespeare, he actually took actual testimony about from one of these trials, this trial in, uh, in the 1590s. Uh, he took stuff from that trial, evidence, and he put it into these the, the scenes in this play, uh, the scenes with, with the witches. And you know, what's interesting is that uh, he actually gives, Shakespeare gives the witches a different verbal style than the other characters in the play. He sets them apart uh, poetically. Uh, we all know how Shakespeare, when he's not just having people speaking in regular prose, he usually has them speaking in a, in a very common poetic meter that we call iambic pentameter. 
in which there's five stresses, da, 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 and each stress is followed by an unstressed syllable. Uh, so pentameter means five, and iambic is this pattern, da, 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 uh, sort of an upbeat and a downbeat. Uh, so it's the, the general pattern, da, 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 da. That's the general rhythm of a typical Shakespeare uh, piece of uh, dialogue or speech. Uh, but uh, the witches generally do not use that meter in contrast with the other characters in the play. The witches use a meter that's uh, called uh, trochaic tetrameter. So the trochaic is the opposite of an iambic pattern. It's instead of ta-da, 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 it's da-da, da-da, da-da. The stress is first and the unstressed syllable is after. Da-da, da-da, da-da. And generally in their lines, there are generally four feet, four of those stresses in a line. Da-da, 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 da-da. It's basically the same meter that you find in, in Henry Wadsworth Longfellow's poem uh, about poems about Hiawatha. Uh, and, uh, and, and, it, and it gives this different uh, pattern, gives the, the, the witches their own little verbal world, in a sense, their own particular style. So, so for example, the, the, in Act One, Scene One, the first witch says, when shall we three meet again? Da, 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 da. In thunder, lightning, or in rain? Da, 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 da. So it's always this quadruple trochaic feeling. Uh, and, and, the, and the last line of this first scene, fair is foul and foul is fair. Four heavy trochaic feet hover through the fog and filthy air. He, actually, that last line, they give it five feet, but it's still da, 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 da. It's still that trochaic pattern. Uh, so it's like, in a sense, they're kind of verbally, linguistically, in a kind of inverted pattern compared with regular, uh, regular people in, in the play. It really helps to, to set them apart as, 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 much as, as much as their outlandish costumes and their, uh, uh, their out, out of control hairstyles. Uh, <laughs> but, but Shakespeare puts it right in the way they, they, they talk. Uh, so that's, I think, a kind of a, a cool thing to, uh, to recognize and 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 you find you find that later on uh when uh, you know when they're talking to Macbeth i think in act I think in act four uh they, they have that very famous line you know bubble bubble toil and trouble that very same pattern is in that uh, in in that scene uh, as well so they really he really keeps it pretty pretty consistent in any case let's let's get off this superstitious stuff because it's get, getting a little it's really creeping me out it's really creeping me out now i think macbeth has a different kind of tragic quality than some of the other major plays and and e even just the ones that we've looked at in this class uh, each of these tragedies have a different kind of fatal flaw for its major protagonists, major character. Uh, so, so King Lear, let's think back to our first session, uh, think, think about the, the lead title character of, of that play. If you had to ascribe a certain kind of, I don't know, failing to this character, uh, what would you say that would be? You know, just by the way you've seen him in this production and uh, as you read the script and as we've discussed it. What would you say is the major thing that trips King Lear up and causes his terrible, terrible fall from grace? Any thoughts? Well, he was a bit demented. I mean, um, he couldn't help it, though. I think it was due to his old age, so I don't know. Okay, so it may not have been his fault, simply a, a quotient of his... Uh, 
uh, his years, you know, just oh, to not being the, the oh. king that, that he was. Okay, well, that certainly is possible. Uh, anything that uh, you might say uh, would be, uh, uh, any other thing you might say might have contributed to his uh, downfall? Well, he was really a poor planner. He was not very bright. And he, and he, and they said right in the play that, you know, the, this wasn't just because he was getting older. He, he, he was making these kinds of decisions all along, but this was just like his supreme okay. final decision when he decided so, to do so kingdom. Ba so bad judgment, you would say. Oh, just, yeah. <laughs> just not really on the beam with his uh, kingly uh, responsibilities. Okay. Okay. So, uh, I, I, if, I, if I could put my or in, uh, I'd like to nominate the concept of blindness. The fact that he cannot really tell, at least in the, the opening scene of the play, he can't really tell who are truly his loyal friends or loyal family members. He mistakes the you know, the, the uh, flowery words of Goneril and Regan, his elder two daughters, and he thinks that they mm -hmm. truly do love him. And, uh, and he doesn't recognize that the daughter who is not willing to play that game of uh, sucking up to the, to the father, that uh, she's the one who really does care about him and she, he banishes her from the kingdom. He's blind to the realities and he, and he banishes his uh, trusty courtier Kent from his kingdom as well. He doesn't recognize mm -hmm. his inherent loyalty and worth. Uh, so uh, because he doesn't recognize who his enemies are and who his friends and his uh, most beloved people are, uh, he uh, is uh, truly, uh, he, he truly is uh, in a bad situation for, for the rest of the play. And, and uh, his, uh, friend uh, Gloucester uh, similarly suffers from that kind of blindness because uh, he doesn't realize that uh, his son Edgar is truly the son of worth and he, he lets his, uh, his steps, his bastard son Edmund, uh, he lets him manipulate him into thinking that Edgar is his mortal enemy who wants to kill him. And uh, I, and he he is driven mad by this uh, trick of fate, and uh, and he literally is made blind in the course of the play. Both of these patriarchs, in a sense, are blind physically, spiritually, and uh, I think that's a key image throughout that play. So to me, that's the real tragedy mm -hmm. of this piece, uh, the tragedy of those two characters. Uh, Coriolanus who we spoke about last week, that great military hero, somehow all that military courage does not prevent him from uh, his ignoble end at the end of that play. So thinking about Coriolanus, what is it about that character? What is his big failing that undoes him in the end? Anyone have a thought about that piece and that character? Michael, I would say ambition, ambition. Okay, toward ambition. Judgment. Okay, that ambition. certainly could be a contributive factor. Okay, anybody else? Well, I don't want to weigh in. He can't control his temper. Okay, that's a big. That's a big flaw. That's a big flaw. Okay. I felt like it was pride, you know. Pride, okay. Yeah. Pride goeth before a fall, they say. <laughs> so uh, that might be with in his case as well. Okay. All right. He, he was arrogant. Arrogant? That doesn't help matters. No, doesn't help <laughs> matters. Uh, okay. All, all, all good, uh, all good uh, descriptions. That's certainly, I think, all part part of the mix. Uh, and uh, if I can again put my oar in the water. Uh, I think his inability to adapt to new conditions, uh, particularly in this story, mm -hmm. the fact that uh, he really, all the, all the courage and daring do and bloodthirstiness that uh, works for him on the battlefield 
doesn't necessarily work in a civic uh, setting as a government leader. Uh, and uh, he's not able to uh, adjust his, uh, his personality or his, his skill set to deal with the new reality mm -hmm. of not being a yeah, leader in a military capacity. Uh, and, uh, and that, in the end, uh, does prove to be a, a big uh, problem for him. So I don't know if that's the deal breaker, but it certainly is uh, yeah, a, bit, yeah. a big problem. He had compromise. Yeah, inability to compromise, inability to meet people halfway, inability to negotiate. Uh, these are all key tools in the uh, politicians and diplomats toolbox. And uh, he works with a more of a, a broad sword, so to speak. And, uh, and the broad sword doesn't work with everybody, uh, you know. So uh, that proves to be a big handicap for him. And uh, we see that doesn't work out well in Act 5. Now, Macbeth, you've, I hope, I hope most of you have seen the Stratford uh, Festival's production, mm -hmm. the, the film of their 2016 production of Macbeth. Uh, and if not, I hope you've tried to take a little perusal of the script of the play from what you've read, from what you've seen, from what you've heard commentators say about him. <laughs> what would you say is his major um, peccadillo, his major flaw? his major uh, his skeleton in the closet. Uh, what, what is it about Macbeth that does bring him low by the end of the play? Any, any thoughts on this? Ambition. Ambition, yeah. He definitely, he's definitely hungry. He really wants to get ahead. So uh, yeah, ambition. And certainly ambition in itself is not a, a, a bad thing, but maybe taken to excess, it can have a, uh, very deleterious, uh, you know, effects. So, uh, so yeah, that that could be a uh, contributive uh, factor. Uh, anybody else? Well, there's something about, you know, he listens to his wife, <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, and mm -hmm. you know, you you think in a way he doesn't seem to have a mind of his own in these things, and ah. and yes, she appeals to the pride, and she appeals. But you wonder about his self, of course, I'm a social worker. You wonder about wow. his self, a self-esteem, you know, <laughs> that he, he may have issues there. <laughs> I, think you need, I think you need to change your profession from social work to theater critic, because oh. I think you're doing <laughs> something here. So, you know, our friend uh, Harold Bloom, who, uh, uh, who wrote this book, Shakespeare, The Invention of the Human, uh, she, he, he makes an interesting statement in the book that uh, whereas... Uh, Whereas, um, uh, that, uh, well, he, may, he makes a statement that, that uh, Lady Macbeth is all will. That, she, you know, that you've heard that, that phrase, the will to power, you know. Mm -hmm. I think that she, you know, emblemizes that idea. And whereas her husband, Macbeth, he really, in, in essence, he really has very little will of his own. Maybe, maybe not on the battlefield, but, but uh, certainly off the, off the field, uh, he really does not have that, that kind of get up and go. And we find this very clear in one of the scenes, I think in act, uh, act one of the play, and then in act two actually, before he does the fatal deed, uh, that uh, he's, he's uh, you know, he really does need people pushing him. And, uh, and in this case, it really is his wife. So it's not, it's not that you shouldn't listen to your wife. God forbid, I should suggest <laughs> that. No, that would be just <laughs> wrong. But, uh, but, when it, when, but when it's Lady Macbeth uh, basically saying, well, you're really not a man if you don't think you can do this. You know, you're not the man I thought you were. Uh, when, when she is basically putting her ambitions to be queen mm -hmm. ahead of maybe their own relationship, uh, the 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 the, uh, the good of their relationship, uh, uh, yeah. I I think she may have overstated and, and exceeded her her bounds. Uh, yeah. You want to tell him to what? zip up his back. <laughs> you want to tell him to zip up his back. You know. Well, it's he's, he's saying you know well, I want you to put up your grown up grown up underpants and right. I, I want you to. Uh, yeah. it, she's she makes the phrase. Uh, you know, you got. Let, let me let me find let me find it because it's such a great it's such a great phrase in the piece. Uh, mm. Sorry. 
Yeah, where she says, we fail, but screw your courage to the sticking place and we'll not yeah. fail. Mm -hmm. You know, she's, she's really laying down the law. Screw your courage to the sticking place and we'll not fail. They're in this together. You know, Harold Bloom makes the bold remark that uh, Macbeth and Lady Macbeth, they may be the happiest married couple in all of Shakespeare's plays. It's not a very good argument for marriage if that's the case, <laughs> by golly. Holy cats, no. There's gotta be, there's gotta be some couple better, better, uh, better suited than they, but uh, that's, that's what Harold Bloom said. So I'll have, to, I'll have to do a little more studying on that. Whew, yeah. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, this is, this, this is uh, you know, and I think that this production, I think this production really does play up that concept that uh, when we first see them, they, they truly do look like a great match, that they are, you know, truly besotted w with each other. There's no question about it. But, but that quickly goes south when she starts to impugn his, his manhood in this scene before that statement uh, uh, where uh, he starts to temporize. Uh, Macbeth, this is in Act 1, Scene 7. Macbeth says, uh, when, when, you know, he's about to get cold feet about this idea to kill the king, to kill King Duncan. He says, we will proceed no further in this business. He hath honored me of late, and I have bought golden opinions from all sorts of people, which would be worn now in their newest gloss, not cast aside so soon. And Lady Macbeth, she lays him out on the carpet. She says, was the hope drunk wherein you dressed yourself? Hath it slept since and wakes it now to look so green and pale at what it did so freely? From this time, such I account thy love. Art thou appeared to be the same in thine own act and valor as thou art in desire? Wouldst thou have that which thou esteemst the ornament of life and live a coward in thine own esteem? Letting I dare not wait upon, I would, like the poor cat in the adage. Uh, Macbeth says, pretty peace. I dare do all that may become a man. Who dares do more is none. And Lady Macbeth answers back, what beast was it then that made you break this enterprise to me? When you durst do it, then you were a man. And to be more than what you were, you would be so much, so much more the man nor time nor place did then, in, uh, did, did then adhere, and yet you would make both. They have, they have made themselves, and that their fitness now does unmake you. I have given suck, and know how tender tis to love the babe that milks me. I would, while it was smiling in my face, have plucked my nipple from his boneless gums and dash the brains out, had I so sworn as, as you have done to this. That's quite an image. Lady Macbeth saying mm -hmm. that I would just mm -hmm. as soon as take the babe suckling on my breast and dash its mm -hmm. brains out. You know, she is pretty fearsome. And, uh, and Macbeth later says, bring forth men children only for thy undaunted metal should compose nothing but males. In a, in a sense, uh, Lady Macbeth is, as, is acting more uh, machismo than, than, than Macbeth is at, at this point. You know, uh, she's the one who's, who's wearing the pants in this family right now. Uh, mm. it's, a, it's a pretty fearsome confrontation of, of, of husband and wife. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, you can see that uh, she really, really is egging him on to do this dastardly deed. Uh, so Mac Macbeth is infinitely, it would seem, suggestible. I mean, the, the witches in the beginning of the play, they, put, they plant the seed. They don't necessarily foretell the future, but they plant the seed. And Macbeth, he just kind of takes that seed and he starts to nurture it 
and make it grow. He, he, uh, he's given the idea that he might become king of Scotland. And he just, he finds these rationalizations that's, that, that, that says, yes, maybe, maybe this is what I need to do sooner rather than, than, than later. Uh, and when he, when he loses courage, uh, Lady Macbeth is there to egg mm -hmm. him on like the coach of a great boxer saying, you can do it, champ, you can do it. Uh, and, uh, and by golly, he does. But he keeps needing that encouragement from, 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 from his wife. So he's got the ideas, he's, he's got the con concepts, but he really needs that will that his wife possesses to carry it through. So they're what you would call a power couple. And uh, <laughs> none can do it by themselves. They really need that teamwork, that collaboration to make this dreaded deed come to pass. But once it comes to pass, that, that's the beginning of their end. Uh, and uh, Lady Macbeth, she's all will, but uh, she in the end, cannot take the consequences of this dastard, dastardly act. And, and she uh, is, is driven little by little into madness. And uh, the implication at the end of the play is that she, she kills herself. Mm -hmm. uh, so she's not, uh, you know, inhuman. You know, these definitely are people. They're not just uh, representatives of evil. This is not just a morality play in which someone plays vice or plays gluttony or plays lust. They're, they're real people with strengths and weaknesses, but uh, their, their weaknesses get the better of themselves in, the, in this particular play. Uh, so, um, so you certainly could say that there is this aura of, of magic and superstition, but it's really very recognizable human failings that are a part of this, part of this play uh, that, uh, you know, they're uh, uh, Harold Bloom says that, you know, he, he asked the question, why do we, why do we identify with Macbeth? You know, this would seem to be someone who's very far from us, who lived maybe in the 11th century in Scotland. We're not, we're not of that era. We're not Scottish. So, you know, why, why do we, why do we start to put ourselves in his, in his point of view? Uh, so this is, this is what, what Bloom says uh, uh, about this. He says, um, the universal reaction to Macbeth is that we identify with him, or at least with his imagination. So, and he talks about other uh, Shakespearean protagonists. Richard III, Iago, Edmund, they are hero villains. But to call Macbeth one of that company seems all wrong. They delight in their wickedness. Macbeth suffers intensely from knowing that he does evil and that he must go on doing ever worse. Uh, Shakespeare rather dreadfully sees to it that we are Macbeth. Our identity with him is involuntary but inescapable. All of us possess, to one degree or another, a proleptic imagination. In Macbeth, it is absolute. He scarcely is conscious of an ambition, desire, or wish before he sees himself on the other side or shore, already having performed the crime that equivocally fulfills ambition. Macbeth terrifies us partly because that aspect of our imagination is so frightening. It seems to make us murderers, thieves, usurpers, rapists. So, there must be a reason. There must be a reason that Hadrian built a wall to wall off Scotland because he was <laughs> <completely laughs> irreconcilable. They, they were savages. And he that may, may be Irish. a point. That That's what well the English point. think, anyway. <laughs> and then, then Macbeth is one of the most savage of those savage Scots. So, sorry to the Scots in the in the audience. I apologize. <laughs> don't, don't mean any aspersion there. But uh, uh, so you know. Bloom is basically saying the, the fatal flaw in Macbeth is not ambition per se. Uh, it's not, it's not because he's bloodthirsty per se. It's because imagination. It's because he can come up with an idea and he can be 
you know, cajoled into an idea, and he could, his imagination just runs away with him. Uh, he, he, uh, Bloom says that Macbeth is almost more like a, a prophet, like a seer. Uh, and you wonder why the you wonder why the witches address him as Thane of uh, Thane of Glamis, Thane of Cawdor, and uh, future King of Scotland. Why do they Why do they connect with this figure when they when he comes upon them? Could it be Could it be that he's like a familiar to them? That he's like a kindred spirit to them? They these witches that they're not you know they're not even called witches in the play they they are called uh, uh weird sisters the three weird sisters uh in the in that era that uh, the weird might have translated as wayward perhaps uh and maybe even uh denoted uh, or connoted the notion of of destiny or fate uh, you, you might compare these three weird sisters to the the, the fates of ancient Greek mythology, people who can kind of have a foreboding of what is to come, uh, you know, being able to kind of prophecy, foretell. Uh, so prophets in a way, female, female prophets in a way. Um, in some religions, they might be holy women, you know, like prophets from the Old Testament. Uh, Macbeth seems to have some of that quality of being able to foretell or being able to at least imagine a future event. Uh, and, and that imagination truly runs ragged, runs him ragged in this play. And in the end, it proves to be his undoing. We'll, we'll, we'll come back to that, that idea. Uh, but for now, I would like to delve into this notion that, you know, you know, people consider this one of Shakespeare's most tightly written plays, that it's, uh, you know, it, it's supposedly it's as almost as short as any play that Shakespeare wrote, uh, much, much shorter than King Lear, definitely shorter than, than Hamlet. And uh, each scene just tumbles onto the next with, uh, with a great speed and, and energy. You barely have a chance to catch your breath in the course of this play. It's a rip-roaring melodrama. And, uh, and you think, boy, what a great story. Uh, well, you know, Shakespeare, not a great inventor of plots and stories. Uh, and, uh, you know, he didn't make up the story of King Lear. He didn't make up the story of Coriolanus. Well, he didn't make up the story of Macbeth either. And uh, I don't know if any of you got the fact sheet that I uh, had sent along to you. Uh, uh, did any of you pick that up? Did any of you see what uh, some of the leading uh, uh, leading sources are of the story of Macbeth? Yes, Don, here, I, I see it. Okay. Oh, oh I, I kind of have a question about comparing Lady Macbeth to Clytemnestra. It seems an odd comparison, other than they were both uh, demented kind of event, or they became that way, but they didn't... Um, Clytemnestra killed her husband. Lady Macbeth didn't go that far. Okay. Well, and in any case, that I get, I guess uh, uh, the uh, guess the the writer was suggesting that maybe the, you know the character type was was similar. I guess. I uh, yeah. And uh, I, I'll have to check my volume of Greek tragedy and uh, check check it out and see if I agree with that. But it was just one <laughs> one theory that Shakespeare might have had access to that. Uh, figure of ancient Greek tragedy or Roman tragedy as a, a possibility, uh, as, a, as a model. Uh, um, but the major, major source material for the piece is uh, this uh, uh, set of chronicles of England, uh, Scotland, and Ireland by Raphael uh, Hollinshed. Uh, and, you know, you can find a lot of excerpts from Hollinshed's chronicles on the internet uh, and uh, if, uh, you know, if you want to find more about the sources of Macbeth, you can do that. Uh, let's see, uh, I'm trying to, it's hard to sort of read the, the website I got this from, but uh, anyway, but I, I did find uh, some of the source material for, for this play, and uh, I thought it might be interesting to read from this uh, history. Uh, this is a history that was written in the 1500s, you know, I think it was published in 1575 originally. Uh, and uh, so it's not really a 
first, you know, an eyewitness account of the of this historical figure. Uh, but at least it gives us a sense of, uh, you know, what Shakespeare was was drawing from. Uh, let's see here. Uh, yeah, yeah. Here we go. So, so let me let me start from this paragraph where we start getting into the area where the play begins. Okay, and it talks about this time of war that's drawing to a close, where Scotland was being invaded by the Danes and by the Norse. Uh, and it says uh, a peace was also concluded at the same time between the Danes and the Scottishmen, ratified as some have written in this wise, that from thenceforth the Danes should never come into Scotland to make any wars against the Scots by any manner of means. And these were the wars that Duncan had with foreign enemies in the seventh year of his reign. Shortly after happened a strange and uncouth wonder, which afterward was the cause of much trouble in the realm of Scotland, as ye shall after hear. It fortuned as Macbeth, and Banquo journeyed toward Forest, where the king then lay. They went sporting by the way together without any other company, save only themselves, passing through the woods and fields, when suddenly in the midst of a land, there met them three women in strange and wild apparel, resembling creatures of an elder world, whom when they attentively, whom whom when they attentively beheld, wondering much at the sight, the first of them spake and said, All hail Macbeth, Thane of Glamis, for he had lately entered into that dignity and office by the death of his father, Sinel. The second of them said, Hail Macbeth, Thane of Cawdor. But the third said, All hail Macbeth, that hereafter shall be king of Scotland. And then Banquo said, What manner of women are you that seem so little favorable unto me, whereas to my fellow here, besides high offices, ye assign also the kingdom, appointing forth nothing for me at all? Yes, said the first of them, we promise greater benefits unto thee than unto him, for he shall reign indeed, but with an unlucky end. Neither shall he leave any issue behind him to succeed in his place, whereas contrarily thou indeed shall not reign at all, but of thee those shall be born which shall govern the Scottish kingdom by long order of continual descent. Herewith, the foresaid women vanished immediately out of their sight. This was reputed at the first, but some vain this was this was reputed at the first, but some vain fantastical illusion by Macbeth and Banquo, insomuch that Banquo would call Macbeth in jest King of Scotland, and Macbeth again would call him in sport likewise the father of many kings. But afterwards, the common opinion was that these women were either the weird sisters, that is, as you would say, the goddesses of destiny, or else some nymphs or fairies endued with knowledge of prophecy by their necromantical science, because everything came to pass as they had spoken. For shortly after, the Thane of Cawdor being condemned at forays of treason against the king, committed, uh, uh, being condemned at forays of reason, uh, of treason against the king committed, his lands, livings, and offices were given of the king's liberality to Macbeth. So this sounds pretty close to what Shakespeare offers in the first couple scenes of Act One. Uh, almost mm -hmm. all of this mm -hmm. seems very much taken lock, stock, and barrel from, uh, from, uh, um, from, uh, from uh, you know, from Holland Shedd's uh, account. Uh, you, know, the, you know, the one thing that, that I find interesting uh, that, um, 
it, you know, it's not mentioned in, in, in that play, in the play specifically, but it's mentioned here. Uh, where, where was it? Yeah, it, it, it says about Macbeth, the, witch, the witches say, neither shall he leave any issue behind him to succeed in his place. So they're saying Macbeth is not going to have any children who will succeed him as, as king. Uh, and, you know, it's kind of hinted at in, in the play uh, later on, uh, later on in that scene that I read to you with Macbeth and Lady Macbeth, she kind of hints that she once suckled a, a babe to her breast, and yet we don't see that child in the play. You get the impression that that child uh, has, has died at some point before the play uh, began. And, and the question is, you know, why can't Macbeth and, and his wife have children? Why can't they have, uh, uh, you know, uh, sons or daughters who can, you know, uh, become monarchs after Macbeth's passing? Are, are they just, uh, you know, medically, physically unable uh, to, to have children? Uh, uh, that's a question that Shakespeare just kind of leaves hanging. Uh, but, but, you know, the, it's said right in this Holland Shed uh, account that uh, Macbeth will not leave any issue behind. And so that's a plot point that's really kind of right in this history. Yeah, yes, Don, you have a comment. Whatever happened to Flats? Banquo's son. Banquo's right. Flats, he escaped. Yeah, but... Yes. So, you know, Banquo... You know, Banquo really was a figure that was kind of invented by these historians of the 16th, of the 17th century. Uh, we don't really know of a real historical Banquo and, and his son, Fleance, but uh, in, the, in the history and in Shakespeare's play, they make Banquo to be the ancestor of basically the house of Stuart. Uh -huh. And uh, I think in act four, there is this scene with the witches in which Macbeth witnesses this apparition scene uh, where he sees this line, this sort, of, this sort of parade of future kings of Scotland who will be on the throne in the future, all of them descending from Banquo and Fleance. And, and of course, these, this line of kings is going to extend to the present Stuart king, James I. So in a sense, uh, in this um, play uh, and in this history by Hollandshed, they are laying the groundwork for the legitimacy of the, of the Stuart line of, of monarchs by showing this lineage from Banquo and Fleance to these other members of the Stuart clan. Uh, so, uh, you know, Shakespeare or some later uh, adapter uh, made sure that James was aware that, uh, you know, that this play acknowledged the legitimacy of his reign by showing this family tree in this uh, apparition scene in Macbeth. Um, I don't know if I answered your question or not, uh, but uh, that's, I think, uh, you know, it sort of works toward an answer that this escape of Fleance from uh, Carnage during this play allows for the Stuart family to finally come to fruition in a later, a later time. Does that make sense? Another, another point is, uh, talk about the Danes, the, uh, the raids on the eastern coast of England and Scotland for many, many years were carried out by the Danes. Okay. And the people in that area, especially those in the monasteries and the, the cities, got so sick of paying ransom to the days and all the terrorism that they brought upon the monasteries, that they got together a bag of valuable things and it's called Danegelt, Danegelt. So when the Danes came ashore, they just handed this and said, okay, here's your ransom, go home. So it was like protection money in a way. It's called Danegelt. Danegelt, boy, wow, that's, that's interesting. Uh, so, you know, the, in, the, in the Holland Shed account, uh, he basically saying that, uh, you know, King Duncan, he was an all right, nice guy, but uh, he really 
uh, was too liberal and free and, and didn't really uh, keep a, you know, a, keep a tight ship, so to speak. Uh, and, uh, you know, a lot of people inside the, the kingdom, you know, ran roughshod in terms of thievery and other crimes. And, uh, and I think that uh, probably, uh, you know, foreign powers uh, were uh, attracted uh, thinking that, well, if, the, if he's got such internal troubles, maybe he's ripe for the picking from a, from a foreign power. So I think, uh, uh, at least according to Hollandshed, his internal weaknesses of his reign uh, maybe invited other powers to, to make war on him, uh, which is certainly an interesting, interesting thought. Um, and, you know, and, uh, you know, after, you know, after this, uh, um, you know, a after this, uh, you know, victory and, uh, you know, uh, and uh, being able to make, make peace with the Danes and the Norse, uh, and, you know, and after, um, you know, after Macbeth kills, after Macbeth kills Duncan, and he ascends to the throne, Hollandshed says something really, really interesting about this, uh, about this uh, time when Macbeth first comes to the throne. Uh, he says that uh, at first Macbeth wasn't, wasn't so bad. So uh, this, is, this is what he says. Macbeth, after the departure of Duncan's sons, uh, I guess the sons of Duncan felt they might mm -hmm. get killed as well. Uh, he used great liber liberality towards the nobles of the realm, thereby to win their favor. And when he saw that no man went about to trouble him, he set his whole intention to maintain justice and to punish all enormities and abuses which had chanced through the feeble and slothful administration of Duncan, and to bring his purpose the better to pass without any trouble or great business, he uh, devised a subtle wile to bring all offenders and misdoers into justice, soliciting sundry of his liege people with high rewards to challenge and appeal, such as most oppressed the commons, to come at a day and place appointed, uh, to fight singular combats within barriers in trial of their accusations. When these, uh, when these thieves and other oppressors of the innocent people were come to battle in this wise, as is said, they were straightways apprehended by armed men and trussed up in halters or gibbets, according as they had justly deserved. The residue of misdoers that were left were punished and tamed in such sort that many years after, all theft, uh, all theft was little heard of, and people enjoying the blissful benefit of good peace and tranquility. Macbeth, showing himself thus a most diligent punisher of all injuries and wrongs attempted by any disordered persons within his realm, was accounted the sure defense and buckler of innocent people. And hereto he also applied his whole endeavor to cause young men to exercise themselves in virtuous manners and men of the church to attend their divine service according to their vocations. Well, sounds like Macbeth was not such a bad guy after all in this history. Uh, indeed, it seemed like he had about 10 years of a, of a decent reign. Happy ending. Where, where's the tragedy here, you know? Uh, of course, can't make a tragedy out of that, you know? You gotta have some irritants, you know? So, so, so it says, it says going on, uh, you know, he caused to be slain sundry thanes as of Caithness, Sutherland, and Ross, because through them and their seditious attempts, much trouble daily arose in the realm. He appeased the troublesome state of Galloway and slew one McGill, a tyrant, who had many years before passed nothing of the regal authority uh, or power. To be brief, such were the worthy doings and princely acts of this Macbeth in the administration of the realm, that if he had attained thereunto by rightful means and continued in uprightness of justice as he began till the end of his reign, he might well have been numbered among the most noble princes that anywhere had reigned. He made many wholesome laws and statutes for the public weal of his subjects. Again, happy mm. ending, happy ending. But <laughs> these and the like commendable laws Macbeth caused 
to be put as then in use, governing the realm for the space of 10 years in equal justice. But this, this was but a counterfeit zeal of equity showed by him, partly against his natural inclination to purchase thereby the favor of the people. Shortly after, he began to show what he was, instead of equity, practicing cruelty. For the prick of conscience, as it chances ever in rule and tyrants, and such as attained to any estate by unrighteous means, caused him ever to fear lest he should be served of the same cup as he had ministered to his predecessor. So, after 10 years of doing good works, he suddenly becomes fearful that someone might do unto him as he did unto mm -hmm. King Duncan. And then that's when the tragic events start occurring in the actual history, at least according to Hollinshed. So, uh, so you know, Shakespeare, he couldn't have a, a, an epic that lasts 10 years, you know, going through all these good deeds of Macbeth. That wouldn't be great drama. So he really telescopes these events in this history, and he makes it seem like there's no point in Macbeth's reign where he's doing any good stuff, you know. It's all just, uh, you know, he gets the, the crown and he starts feeling uh, all uh, paranoid about what's going to happen. You know, if Banquo lives, you know, I may, might not have my crown long. I've got to do away with Banquo. I've got to have some assassins go over to, to England uh, and assassinate this son of Don Duncan and that son, that son of Duncan. Uh, uh, he's just full of all this, uh, uh, you know, fear that it all could all be taken away from him if he doesn't keep on going about his murderous uh, assassination business. Uh, so a little different from Hollinshed, because Shakespeare, if he's gonna be a dramatist, he's gotta twist the, the wheel of the dramatic, uh, you, know, uh, you know, tension to, uh, to keep the, you know, the plot going. And, and that's the way he does it, by really just telescoping it into a very brief amount of time that all these dreadful events uh, uh, happen. So we just have a, a little bit of time. Uh, we all know the events of, of the play. We all, um, oh, you know what, what, what before, we, before we talk about your opinion about this production, one of the things that, that uh, Bloom says in his book is that uh, uh, thing we, the thing that, that really makes us identify with Macbeth uh, in this play is that every, every time he goes about you know, making a decision about, am I going to kill him? Am I not going to kill him? We are hearing his thoughts. We are, he's making all these little soliloquies, these little inner dialogues in which he weighs the pluses and minuses, the, the, the pros and cons about doing all these different things. Uh, and uh, he's always weighing the moral algebra. Uh, he's not amoral, he's profoundly moral and he just keeps making the wrong decisions over and over again, but he knows what's right and wrong. Uh, he, just, he just keeps, you know, again, making the same mistake and going down the, the bad path. But every time he does a bad thing, he knows about it. He, he's conscious of it and, uh, and he suffers from it. Uh, and uh, uh, and we, we suffer along, along with him. Uh, his conscience will not let him rest. Uh, it doesn't drive him mad. Uh, Lady Macbeth's conscience drives her mad, but uh, up to the end, he is conscious of all the bad that he has done cumulatively, and uh, and he cannot let go of that uh, realization. It just makes his outlook on life darker and darker and darker until mm -hmm. by the end, he is the complete nihilist, saying that famous monologue about life being a tale told by an idiot. idiot full of sound and fury signifying nothing. Uh, this is the most black uh, nihilistic uh, statement he could make, you know, that statement of Lear's, nothing will come of nothing. Well, it seems like that he has come to this point where all he has is a whole lot of nothing and he doesn't see much uh, of a future uh, to come from that. Uh, so, uh, it's this notion that we are constantly hearing him, overhearing him, think about all all the evil that he has done, and uh, you know fully, you know 
fully suffering from the, the realization of that. Uh, he definitely has a conscience. Uh, so you've all seen this production, uh, and it's a fairly traditional Shakespearean style production done on, on the thrust stage of, a, of the festival theater. It's all, you know, done with uh, various scenic effects that could, be could have been plausible in Shakespeare's time. Uh, the, the one thing that I think is non-traditional about this production is the fact that both Lady Macbeth and, and Macbeth are cast very young. Uh, Ian Lake and Kristen uh, Pellerin, uh, they're, uh, they're definitely, uh, I'd say a generation younger than traditionally uh, Macbeth and Lady Macbeth are cast. Uh, and I think it gives a very different uh, aspect, a different kind of dynamic to, to their relationship and a different dynamic to the events of the play uh, when they're played as up and coming, you know, aggressive, uh, youthful, ambitious people rather than uh, people who might be on the cusp of being has-beens and looking at their last chance at uh, glory. Um, so, uh, you know, um, there's supposed to be this film that uh, uh, Joel Cohen of the, of the Cohen brothers is mm -hmm. making about Macbeth, and it's going to star uh, uh, Denzel Washington as Macbeth and Francis McDormand, uh, 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 Cohen's mm -hmm. wife, as Lady Macbeth. That sounds mm -hmm. like a great uh, cast, but, uh, you know, they're older actors. Uh, and, uh, you know, and he says it was very important for their, this telling of the story that uh, it would seem like that uh, this might be their last chance, you know, to really make something of themselves. Then this would give them the motivation to do uh, the, 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 the great deeds that they, that they do in the play, uh, these enormous evil deeds. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that there's a point to be said about that. Uh, so I'd like, to, I'd like to get your reaction uh, to... Uh, the piece. Uh, raise your hand if you've seen the piece, and if so, I'd like to hear your your thoughts. Frank, uh, what what did you think about this this particular take on the play? Uh, well, I found it very interesting. It was uh, it was very entertaining. Uh, probably the only complaint that I have about it, though, was the the visual effects, how they came across on a TV screen. Okay, because it was really dark. You know, the set was dark. Yes. Uh, I, that, that's really the only complaint. Certainly the, uh, the play itself was, uh, was very good. The actors did very well. Uh, the children maybe uh, needed a little bit more experience. Because <laughs> uh, you could tell by the way they were talking, uh, the, the, the one speaking part. Yeah. But, yeah, um, but, yeah it, was, uh, it was, I think it was put together very well. Okay, that. thank you. Uh, who else? Who else has seen it? Raise your hand. Okay, uh, Gail. What? What? What did you think? Well, um, I like that they're younger actors. I saw actually years ago. LSU has a theater department, and they're very well. You know, have won awards and everything. And they did Macbeth with a younger uh, couple too. Okay. And you know, it's so much more sensual. Oh, yeah. And, you know, which which I, I guess I kind of like, you know, because it, okay. okay. it shows a lot of emotion and, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, depth, more depth in a way. Okay. Maybe not, but in a way it does. Um, so, yeah, and I think, you know, I always think it's kind of Lady Macbeth's play. And so when, <laughs> when they have a young Lady Macbeth who's very sexual and very emotional, you know, it kind of really is dramatic. <laughs> so yeah, I liked yeah. It. I liked it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, I mean, when this, when this Lady Macbeth read that letter, I mean, you could see the excitement mm -hmm. in her yeah. eyes, you know, this, right. this burst of good fortune happening to her and her husband. You could see that it was, she felt like it was a brave new world for, for them. Let's yeah. see, I think I saw Marianne Hefner's uh, hand up. Did you see yes. this? I just, I thought it was, um, I, I liked her, her being young and he, both of them being mm -hmm. young. I, I hadn't seen a, the production Unless I think I might have, but don't remember. But but I thought it was a good way to play it out with the youth. Okay, all righty. Let's see. Uh, uh, let's see. Anybody else have a have a thought that they want to weigh in with? Yeah, I have a question. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. We noticed the thrust stage is covered with a thick shag rug. What was the reason for that? 
Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not, not sure about the substance, but uh, uh, there was a little, that one of the videos uh, is a dialogue between the director and their, his designer, uh, Julie Fox. And I, I think that they felt that the octagonal shape of the um, basic festival theater stage just looked a little too maybe, you know, yeah. orderly and, uh, you know, uh, mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. uh, that he felt he wanted an image of greater, I don't know, violence in the piece. And so that uh, sort of diamond shaped uh, stage uh, that they created uh, almost looked like a kind of the blade of a, of a sword thrust out toward the audience. Mm -hmm. That uh, the notion that that uh, more maybe violent, uh, you know, ang angular kind of shape might be more appropriate to this play. Uh, I think, uh, you know, it, I think, uh, you know, maybe that is better for the general emotional temperature of the piece. So I, I think it was the, the notion that this is not an ordered society in which that kind of symmetrical octagonal shape would best serve, but something that was a little less, a little more, uh, you know, asymmetrical and uh, maybe sharp as daggers, you know. Uh, you know, the notion of knives and daggers and swords, those images are very strong in this play. So to have that shape on the floor, I think, does, I think, uh, serve this uh, piece. Uh, yes, Marianne. Just two, two questions. One is the, the, uh, um, the play itself, when your imagination is so different about the scenery, and then when they come out at the end, it looks so ordinary, but how they how they weave that to look so different, I think, is very very talented. And the other thing, Michael, is I read in the the write up of the different people that had done the play and the years and so on. And at the end, it had Alan Cumming, yeah, was playing all the parts. Unless I read wow. this, yeah, I I was I I mean I, I had a distinct memory that he had uh, been in a production, but I didn't know the nature of it, but. It, it's like he's the, a patient in a, in a violent psychiatric ward. And it's like he's reliving the, the events of this story. And he, and he, you know, if he's a you know, schizophrenic kind of person, you know, he could play all these different personalities in the course of the piece. I don't know how that worked in practicality, but it sounds yeah. like a fascinating yeah. uh, con concept. Obviously a tour de force for a, a great actor. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, I can only imagine how the audience uh, re received that. But uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, I mean, this is a play that deals with madness. So, you know, to have that kind of a concept for this story, you know, might be uh, a a apropos. But, you know, but I think, you know, militating against that, uh, Macbeth himself does not go mad. You know, his wife does, but, but he's mm -hmm. fully, fully aware. He's fully conscious until he gets his head cut off, off stage. Uh, he, he, he's got his faculties, you know. Uh, so to call this a play purely of madness, I think might be considered an, an mm -hmm. overstatement. So uh, perhaps that production was maybe laying it on a little thick okay. in terms of that good, aspect. Yeah. You know, it's, madness is a part of the play, but it's not, it's not all of the play. Let, let's let's put it that way. But but yeah, I was pretty astonished too. Uh, and you know you know if you go on the uh, the Broadway, I, th I think they call it an I. I think they call the website IBDB, the the Internet Broadway Database. You can uh, you can pick up um, you can pick up uh, photographs on that uh, when you go to that uh, production of. Of Macbeth, and let me let me see, let me see if I can find what what year that was. I think it was like in the 2013s. I, I think it was like about 2013. Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, 2013. Uh, if you click on that that production, you will be able to bring up some photos of Alan Cumming in this play, and it's it's a really fascinating, mm -hmm. uh, very realistic. Uh, set design to show this this psychiatric ward that he's playing this story out in. Uh, so yeah, if you're really curious, uh, there is visual evidence for that that production. Uh, any other thoughts about the Stratford uh, production before we close today? 
Okay. Well, uh, did any of you just uh, hate the fact that they, you know, peopled this production with protagonists who are uh, 20 years too young for the parts? Well, any people who felt that way? Okay. You, most of you were good for, good with it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Alrighty. Very good. And if if you have not seen the play, I think it's just up for uh, another day or so. I think it's up tomorrow and maybe through tomorrow through Thursday afternoon. So so now's your chance to to check it out. I know some people like to hear our our talks before they go see the play. If if so, then uh, now's the time to to check it out. Uh, next week, we will be going on to another play about magic, namely The Tempest. Uh,